How's it going, folks? Welcome back to another alternate history scenario. The focus of this video today is the nation of Guatemala. Without further ado, let's get into it. Guatemala, a gorgeous land of imposing mountains and lush tropical rainforests. A land of abundance and biodiversity where the native Maya people have lived in harmony with nature since time immemorial. Guatemala, a country rife with corruption where gangs run rampant Crime rates are sky high, and 97% of murders go unsolved. A country torn asunder by civil war and genocide over the course of 36 years, in which 134,000 Maya lost their lives for no reason other than their ethnicity. Reconciling these two extremes, these two sides of Guatemala, is simply part and parcel of understanding Guatemalan history and Guatemala's national identity today. The spirit of the Guatemalan people is indomitable, but this isn't to say it hasn't been tested. While evidence points to human settlement as early as 6500 BC, the Maya people, who largely shaped Guatemala's history before first contact with Spain, first settled in Guatemala in 1500 BC, where they constructed a mighty civilization that lasted until 900 AD, when it collapsed and Maya city-states emerged to fill the void. Spanish forces arrived to conquer what is now modern-day Guatemala in 1524. However, unlike the defeat of the Mexica in Mexico, which was done by simply wiping out the ruling class and killing the Mexica emperor, Motecuzoma y Luicamina, in Guatemala the Spanish were faced with a more demanding conquest. There was no one emperor to kill and throw the Maya into chaos, but rather countless different tribes and city-states, each with their own leader. Thus, the Spanish had to conquer Guatemala tribe by tribe. This process was slow, brutal, and grueling, resulting in the campaign to conquer Guatemala only ending in 1697 with the fall of the last Maya kingdom, nearly 200 years after the conquest first began. Guatemala was incorporated into the vice royalty of New Spain. The indigenous peoples were subjugated and forced to work for the benefit of their Spanish overlords. The Spanish language was introduced to Guatemala, where it remains in use today. Likewise, the Catholic Church converted much of the indigenous population. This ruthless exploitation of Guatemala continued until the Latin American Wars of Independence, in which Guatemala declared its independence from Spain on September 15, 1821. However, soon after the end of Spanish rule, Guatemala was occupied by the First Mexican Empire from 1822 to 1823. After breaking free from the Mexicans, Guatemala would spend the next two decades as part of the Federal Republic of Central America, until that confederation's collapse in 1841, after which Guatemala, along with all of today's Central American nations minus Panama, became an independent country. The decades that followed Guatemalan independence saw extreme political instability, mass exploitation of the peasantry, and the rise of multiple dictatorships in Guatemala. By the 1890s, the American agribusiness Chiquita Banana, previously known as the United Fruit Company, by the way, they changed their name so people wouldn't be able to connect the two, had arrived in Guatemala. Guatemalan dictator Manuel Estrada Cabrera struck a deal with Chiquita Banana in order to secure funds to complete multiple infrastructure projects across Guatemala. In exchange for the funds, Chiquita Banana was given numerous concessions, including the ability to operate in Guatemala without paying taxes, massive grants of indigenous land, and control of most of Guatemala's railroads. After several assassination attempts, an epidemic, a mass crackdown on political opposition and workers' movements, and a natural disaster, Estrada Cabrera was toppled in a revolution in 1920, later dying in prison. After the overthrow of Estrada Cabrera, Guatemala went from authoritarianism to anarchy, with Guatemala having six presidents between 1920 and 1931, three of whom only ruled for a combined 63 days, and one of whom was most likely assassinated. This era of political instability came to an end with the emergence of Jorge Ubico. Jorge Ubico was a Guatemalan general who came to power in an election, but shortly thereafter seized total power and became a dictator. Ubico militarized every facet of Guatemalan society, implemented the institution of debt slavery and forced labor, forcibly displaced the indigenous Maya from lands coveted by Chiquita Banana, and legalized the summary execution of workers. 
Soon enough, Guatemala was converted into a totalitarian dictatorship. General Ubico was extremely pro-American, to a fault, and granted Chiquita Banana even more concessions than it already had. General Ubico oversaw the transformation of the Guatemalan state into an apparatus of oppression and violence. Ubico, widely considered one of Guatemala's worst dictators ever, ruled the nation with an iron fist for 13 long years. However, his totalitarian rule bred discontent, and after student protests caused Ubico to suspend the constitution on June 22, 1944, the Guatemalan Revolution began. After a schoolteacher, Maria Chinchilla Recinos, was killed during a peaceful demonstration on June 25, 1944, the revolution erupted, leading to Ubico's resignation on July 1, 1944. However, he was merely succeeded by Federico Poncevaides, a loyalist who took orders from him and only intensified the government's oppression further, soon losing the support of the entire Guatemalan military. On October 19, 1944, a group of high-ranking army officers, led by a young and charismatic army captain, Jacobo Arbenz, launched a coup that ousted Ubico's loyalists from power. After the successful Guatemalan Revolution, free and fair elections were held in December 1944, resulting in philosopher Juan José Arevalo being elected president with 86% of the vote, the first democratically elected president in all of Guatemalan history. Jacobo Arbenz, now a lieutenant colonel, became Arevalo's defense minister. Arevalo's administration ushered in an era of political freedom that was unprecedented in Guatemalan history. The new governing political philosophy, Arevalismo, was in many ways similar to the New Deal policies of Franklin D. Roosevelt in the United States. Arevalismo was an anti-fascist, anti-communist democratic ideology based on reforming capitalism and creating a progressive and peaceful society for Guatemala. Arevalo himself oversaw the implementation of new protections for workers in Guatemala, along with the introduction of a higher minimum wage. Many new schools, hospitals, and houses were built during this era. This period of Guatemalan history also saw the birth of strong labor unions within its cities. President Arevalo left office in 1951 following the 1950 presidential election, peacefully transferring power to the winning candidate, Colonel Jacobo Arbenz. While Arevalo had tried to improve the living standards of the peasants of Guatemala, it was difficult to do so without instituting mass land reform within the nation, something that was urgently needed because Chiquita Banana, despite owning 42% of all of the land in Guatemala, only utilized 15% of it, thus stifling the Guatemalan economy due to so much unused land being unable to be tilled. However, Chiquita Banana had amassed major political influence in Guatemala since their arrival in 1898, making any challenge to their interests dangerous. Arevalo had his mind on other matters during the presidency, passing the issue of land reform onto his successor, who eagerly accepted the challenge. President Arbenz pledged to end feudalistic practices in Guatemala and reduce the influence of foreign corporations like Chiquita Banana in Guatemalan politics by instituting land reform. At the time Arbenz took office, 2% of the Guatemalan population owned 70% of the country's land. Land reform was the central focus of his government, and along with top advisors and economists, President Arbenz drafted up an agrarian reform law known as Decree 900. Decree 900, passed by the Guatemalan Congress on June 17, 1952, sought to transfer ownership of uncultivated land from corporations like Chiquita Banana to the impoverished Guatemalan peasantry, who would then be empowered to farm the land themselves, building even more farms and producing even more agricultural products and crops. Only parcels of land that were greater than 673 acres, or smaller parcels of which two-thirds were unused, were affected by Arbenz's new law. However, Chiquita Banana was disproportionately impacted by Decree 900, mostly due to its own greed. Even though they were hardly taxed at all, Chiquita Banana still undervalued the land they owned on purpose, to hide just how much money they were making off the backs of underpaid Guatemalan labor. When the land reform began, Chiquita Banana was compensated with the amount they had valued the land at, which lost them untold sums of money due to their obfuscation of the real value of the land. President Arbenz himself was affected, losing 1,700 acres of his land as a result of his own law. Of the 350,000 privately held lands in Guatemala at the time, only 1,700 of these holdings, mostly held by corporations, were affected by the process, with the other 348,300 holdings remaining under their previous owners. Nevertheless, the 1% and corporations of Guatemala were outraged, having lost millions of dollars worth of land due to their own undervaluing of it. The land reform process continued well into 1954, 
by which time 1.4 million acres of land had been redistributed, benefiting 500,000 people who now had land of their own. The government gave out loans to the new landowners, many of them indigenous Maya, to help them start their own new farms, and productivity increased across Guatemala, with many ordinary people repaying the loans quickly as they were lifted out of poverty simply by working the land as they had before. The Guatemalan agricultural industry was booming, but not all was well. Tragically, the profits of the shareholders of Chiquita Banana back in the United States had been negatively impacted. Although Chiquita Banana had only been using 15% of the land they owned, they still refused to accept the loss of their unused land to the Maya peasants. Because of this, Chiquita Banana began a propaganda campaign against President Arbenz in the United States, aggressively lobbying the U.S. government to take action against Arbenz and the Guatemalan people. Chiquita Banana spent half a million dollars attempting to convince the American people and the United States Congress that Arbenz was a communist dictator who had to be overthrown, which was completely untrue. In 1953, Dwight Eisenhower became the new president of the United States and was far more hawkish than his predecessor, Harry Truman. Eisenhower's new CIA director and Secretary of State, brothers Allen and John Foster Dulles, both had close ties to Chiquita Banana, and by August 1953, the Eisenhower administration began plotting to overthrow the Guatemalan government. Carlos Castillo Armas, a Guatemalan military officer exiled after a failed coup in 1949, was selected to lead the coup d'etat against Arbenz's government. Castillo Armas gathered a force of 480 mercenaries and former soldiers to begin training to overthrow the government. In January 1954, the plot to overthrow the Guatemalan government was leaked, and Arbenz learned what Castillo Armas was planning to do. Arbenz began preparations to arm the peasantry in case of an invasion or attempted coup, However, because the United States had ceased arms shipments to Guatemala, Arbenz attempted to purchase arms from Canada, West Germany, and the Central African Federation. However, the United States also put a stop to these arms sales after exerting pressure on the would-be sellers. As a last resort, Arbenz was forced to buy arms from communist Czechoslovakia, a move that sent the United States and CIA into full panic mode, leading to the launch of the coup. On the 18th of June, 1954, Operation PB Success began, with Carlos Castillo Armas, backed by the CIA, leading an invasion of Guatemala with a small force of Guatemalan exiles to overthrow Arbenz. The invasion was accompanied by an intense campaign of psychological warfare, complete with airdropped leaflets and radio broadcasts from the rebel radio station Voice of Liberation, which warned of hundreds of rebels under the command of Carlos Castillo Armas advancing towards Guatemala City to overthrow President Arbenz. This was done by the CIA with the intent of forcing Arbenz to resign. Perhaps most frustrating was the fact that even though nearly all of the rebel offensives were defeated by the government, Carlos Castillo Armas' rebels won the battle in the realm of psychological warfare. The perception of Castillo Armas' rebels being backed by the United States, as well as the intent psychological warfare utilized by the CIA, quickly caused the Guatemalan army to become demoralized. Despite a government victory against the rebels at the town of Sacapa, by June 25th, psychological warfare had convinced large swaths of the armed forces that resistance was futile and many were left unwilling to fight. When President Arbenz was informed of the unwillingness of the army to fight, he decided to arm the civilian population of Guatemala City, the capital. However, by this point, the government had lost its momentum and no volunteers appeared to take up arms. Following this, the military began to turn on Arbenz, and soon enough, the military high command was divided on whether to seize power for themselves or transfer power to Castillo Armas. Arbenz, determined to avoid further bloodshed, resigned from the presidency on June 27, 1954. Castillo Armas and his rebels entered Guatemala City soon after, and established a dictatorship led by Castillo Armas on July 7, 1954. Jacobo Arbenz and his family sought refuge at the Mexican embassy for 73 days. During this time, the CIA and Castillo Armas regime began a propaganda campaign to discredit Jacobo Arbenz in the eyes of the Guatemalan people. Eventually, Arbenz and his family were able to leave the country, but as Arbenz and his family boarded a plane for exile in Mexico, the authorities claimed that he was hiding jewelry and forced him to strip naked for one final humiliation. No jewelry was ever found. The Arbenz family fled into exile, going from country to country across the world as the U.S. pressured any country hosting the family to expel them. The former president entered a deep depression and became an alcoholic, while his family collapsed, with his wife separating from him and his daughter taking her own life in 1965. After the passing of his daughter, Arbenz's mental and physical health deteriorated, and he died a broken man in Mexico City in 1971. 
After Advance's overthrow, the CIA desperately searched for evidence that his government had been infiltrated by Soviet communists, but turned up nothing. On October 19, 1995, the remains of the former president were returned to Guatemala and given a burial with full military honors. In 2011, the government of Guatemala publicly apologized to the Advance family for what had befallen Jacobo Advance. While the fate of President Advance was awful, Guatemala's fate was even worse. Carlos Castillo Armas launched a mass purge of Guatemalan society, killing thousands, crushing any dissent, and reversing Jacobo Advance's land reform program, confiscating peasant land and returning it to Chiquita Banana. On July 26, 1957, Castillo Armas was shot to death by a member of his own secret service who had grown to hate him. But Castillo Armas's death brought no peace to Guatemala, as the damage was already done. The democratic institutions built through the hard work of the Guatemalan Revolution had been destroyed by just three years of the Castillo Armas regime. All of the political power in Guatemala had become concentrated within the military, and soon the military government was beset by infighting, breeding further chaos in Guatemala. The rest of the 1950s saw four successive presidents as well as mass instability fomented by electoral fraud and military coups. Government repression reached a fever pitch as increasingly oppressive governments took power in Guatemala, resulting in the outbreak of the Guatemalan Civil War in November 1960. Indigenous peasants, communists, democracy advocates, sectors of the military, and labor unions banded together, forming multiple guerrilla movements to overthrow the dictatorship in Guatemala. In response, the government formed paramilitary groups known as death squads to crush the rebellion. The Guatemalan death squads, funded by the United States, committed countless atrocities and massacres across rural and urban Guatemala. The Guatemalan Civil War lasted for 36 agonizing years and saw countless human rights violations by the government, the destruction of the Guatemalan economy, a genocide of the indigenous Maya, and 200,000 Guatemalans killed. By the end of the war, Guatemala was a severely impoverished country racked by political and gang violence with an extremely corrupt and weak government. The story of modern Guatemala is infuriating as the 1954 coup transformed Guatemala, a prosperous democratic society, into a dictatorship torn apart by civil war. But what if Guatemala's history had gone differently? What if, in an alternate timeline, the 1954 Guatemalan coup d'etat failed? Let's find out. Our point of divergence occurs in the spring of 1954, when the government of Guatemala was attempting to acquire more arms amidst concerns of growing anti-government activity along its borders. Although President Arbenz at first wished to acquire arms from the United States, the U.S. government forbade any further arms sales to Guatemala, citing concerns over possible communist infiltration of its government. Now, unlike in our timeline, where Arbenz simply attempted to purchase arms from West Germany, Canada, and the Central African Federation, which was then halted by U.S. interference and led to Arbenz attempting to purchase arms from the Czechoslovaks, thus providing impetus for the coup, in this alternate timeline, the Arbenz government, after the initial American refusal to sell arms, predicts that further deals with other capitalist nations will also be sabotaged, thus necessitating them to think outside the box. Correctly predicting from what evidence was available that anti-government forces were at a numerical disadvantage and thus would be utilizing tactics beyond standard offensive warfare, Arbenz and his generals then planned to arrange arms deals that would not catch the eyes of the U.S. From the Central African Federation's Army Depot, Guatemala acquires 15 37mm anti-aircraft guns. From West Germany, Guatemala acquires roughly 50 stationary radio jamming transmitters left over from the Nazi era. From Canada, Guatemala acquires 25 M1917 tanks labeled on paper as scrap metal to be broken down and used for repairs. All of these arms deals successfully go through, as the United States entities monitoring Guatemalan government activity had been trained to keep a lookout for shipments containing machine guns, mortars, mines, grenades, and aircraft. Not radio jammers and scrap. As for the anti-aircraft guns, due to Guatemala ordering them from the Central African Federation's Army Depot, a very obscure player in the world of arms sales, one might say, the sale went unnoticed by the U.S. After the successful completion of the arms sales on April 1, 1954, and despite protests from some in the military who wished to proceed with buying arms from the Czechoslovaks, President Arbenz stressed calm and readiness, stating, We have done all we can. The people have placed their confidence in us, and now we must place our confidence in God. On May 1st, 1954, the Voice of Liberation radio station, run by Guatemalan rebels in Miami, began broadcasting propaganda to the people of Guatemala regarding the Advance government. 
Although it is a tough call to be made in a democracy, President Advents, although originally planning to use the jammers to block communication between rebel forces, decides to post the German jamming systems across Guatemala's cities. Any who attempt to tune into the Voice of Liberation would instead hear traditional Maya music broadcast at the same frequency with greater power. In Miami, technicians would work day and night to no avail attempting to bypass the jammers, and the constant static and feedback coming from the jammer signal would eventually result in several broadcasters developing severe lifelong tinnitus. Without the Czechoslovak arms deal, which triggered the coup in our timeline, as well as the Voice of Liberation radio broadcasts, which were crucial to Castillo Armas' psychological warfare efforts, plans for the coup attempt were effectively at a standstill. By June 10th, Chiquita Banana's board of investors and leadership, via the CIA, complained to the Eisenhower administration that their inaction was creating a totalitarian state in Guatemala, and that action had to be taken. Although Eisenhower did not feel the conditions were right for a coup, he reluctantly gave the green light on June 14, 1954. On the 18th of June, 1954, the rebel forces of Carlos Castillo Armas, now called Castillistas, 480 men strong, crossed the borders of Honduras and El Salvador into Guatemala on a mission to overthrow its democratic government. On the first day of the invasion, the towns of Esquipulas, Jutiapa, and Sacapa came under assault by the rebels. Sacapa, a major army frontier post, had received 10 of the M1917 tanks and was able to wipe out the entire rebel force within two hours, backed by the full strength of the Guatemalan military garrison stationed there. From there, government forces were able to relieve the town of Esquipulas and Jutiapa from the rebel assault. A propaganda leaflet drop in Guatemala City and a bombing run over the city of Chiquimula both failed after all four rebel planes were shot down by Guatemalan anti-aircraft guns. By the end of the day, Castillo Armas had lost 160 men and all of his aircraft. Just one day later, on June 19th, the CIA warned President Eisenhower that without further aid, Castillo Armas would be finished. Authorizing further aircraft shipments to the rebels, CIA reinforcement efforts would backfire after a British ship, the SS Springfjord, was mistaken for a government vessel by a rebel bomber and blown up in Puerto San Jose, killing the entire British crew on board and triggering a diplomatic incident between the US and the UK so dire it left President Eisenhower reticent to provide any further aid to Castillo Armas. Although some in the Guatemalan military had been demoralized by fears of an American invasion if the Castillistas were defeated, after the bombing of the SS Springfjord and the resulting diplomatic incident, morale was restored as it seemed Castillo Armas's poorly trained pilots had cost him American support. On June 25th, after days of fighting government forces in the Guatemalan jungles, the Castillistas made a final desperate push to, quote, liberate the capital. However, cut off from air support and unable to propagandize the people of Guatemala, the Castillistas stood no chance. Bogged down by the constant fighting, the Castillistas became encircled by government forces in the city of Matacesquitla, two hours away from Guatemala City. As the Guatemalan army slaughtered the rebels, Carlos Castillo Armas, who earlier that day had implored his men to give their lives for the liberation of their country, was unceremoniously run over by one of his own men while both tried to flee for their lives in the chaos. On June 25, 1954, after a week of fighting and uncertainty, the Guatemalan coup d'etat attempt ended in catastrophic failure. The fallout from the coup was immediate. As President Arbenz was informed of the government victory at Matacesquintla, he then took to the airwaves, informing the nation of the attempted coup which had been successfully thwarted by the Guatemalan armed forces. Citizens of Guatemala, I reach out to you today to inform you that the forces of our democratic government have thwarted a small uprising by the forces of the old Ubico regime, who sought to once again subjugate us and return the people of this great nation into a state of slavery. But democracy has triumphed. Today, fellow countrymen, we stand triumphant over the forces of tyranny. Our brave soldiers spilled their blood in defense of our democracy, and the best way of repaying their sacrifice is to continue this era of prosperity and democracy for generations to come. God bless Guatemala, and God bless its people. After an exhaustive search of the headquarters of the rebels in Matacesquintla, the Guatemalan government uncovers irrefutable proof that Chiquita Banana, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the United States government were the true driving forces behind the coup attempt. Castillo Armas had merely been their puppet. President Eisenhower was livid following the CIA's failures in Guatemala, as well as the pressure exerted on him by Chiquita Banana. After a thorough mission report on the events of the coup, President Eisenhower summons CIA Director Alan Dulles to his office and forces him to resign. On July 1st, 1954, 
Dulles was awarded the National Security Medal at the White House to help him save face after presenting President Eisenhower with his letter of resignation. Dulles is replaced as CIA Director by former Secretary of the Air Force John McCone. Cognizant of how the 1953 Iranian coup had made the CIA overconfident, under McCone, the CIA would privately disavow sponsoring coups, at least as a first resort. In Guatemala, President Arbenz mulled over what to do with the bombshell correspondence implicating the CIA and U.S. government in the coup attempt. While some influential leftist advisors urged him to publicize the information, his generals urged caution, noting that perhaps the best course of action may be to keep his cards close to his chest and not disclose the CIA's involvement in the spirit of repairing their diplomatic relationship with the U.S. On July 20th, 1954, American Ambassador John Purifoy, one of the coup's advocates, was summoned by President Arbenz to the presidential residence, La Casa Crema. Although Purifoy came armed with a plethora of threats to rebuff the expected tirade from Arbenz, he is shocked to find the president in one of his sunrooms with two cups of coffee. Arbenz asks the ambassador to be seated and goes on to discuss how he assumes that by now, Purifoy had heard of the isolated rebellion which was quashed back in June. Arbenz then goes on to state that with aggressive non-state actors threatening the peace, Guatemala will need the help of the United States now more than ever. Arbenz thereby requests that the arms embargo unfairly imposed upon Guatemala be lifted, and asks Purifoy to deliver his message to Washington. Roughly a week later, a cable from Washington reaches Arbenz announcing that steps would be taken to lift the arms embargo as long as the openly communist Guatemalan Labor Party, legalized after the Guatemalan Revolution, was once again banned. Arbenz agrees, and during an emergency session of the Guatemalan Congress, citing new and evolving threats to Guatemala, the Communist Party of Guatemala is once again banned. On August 1st, the United States government ceased its undeclared economic war against Guatemala, with the Eisenhower administration telling Chiquita Banana to cut their losses, telling them that the increased productivity that followed the land reform would only benefit Americans' hunger for fresh fruit in the long run. In Guatemala, in the aftermath of the coup, the Arbenz government established a new government-owned company to manage the land purchased from Chiquita Banana, known as the Guatemalan Fruit Cooperative, or GFC for short, a venture which would go on to make billions based on its revolutionary approach to agribusiness, based on paying its workers living wages, allowing the peasants to work towards full ownership of their lands, and expanding trading relationships with the North American nations of Mexico, Canada, and the United States. By the end of 1954, as a sort of silent apology for the CIA's actions, the Eisenhower administration brokers a partnership between the GFC and the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers in order to help develop and implement groundbreaking strategies and biotechnologies to further grow the Guatemalan agricultural industry. The year 1955 would see a year of national reconciliation and growth, as the Guatemalan Revolution continued to uplift and improve the lives of the Guatemalan people. President Arbenz devoted this year to implementing further social justice legislation, including tax cuts for the poor and several bills aimed at improving women's rights within Guatemala. All the while, the GFC would emerge as the bedrock of the new Guatemalan economy, with productivity up 55% in comparison to when its lands were under the control of Chiquita Banana. With the 1956 election coming up, President Arbenz opted not to run for re-election after his advisors and generals convinced him that stepping down after one term would further repair relations between Guatemala and the U.S. A new president, free of Arbenz's past baggage, would be the best choice for Guatemala. And so it was that on March 15, 1955, President Arbenz announced to the nation that he would not be running for a second term. Many Guatemalans lamented that Arbenz had chosen not to run again, but respected his decision. President Arbenz's political party, Partido Acción Revolucionaria, or the Revolutionary Action Party, often abbreviated as simply the PAR, was in shambles during the run-up to the election. Although Arbenz had enjoyed massive success, the PAR itself had been weakened by frequent infighting between the center-left and left-wing factions of the party. In the party primaries, the lame duck Arbenz took on the role of peacemaker within the party, stressing reconciliation and civility. Soon enough, two major candidates arose within the PAR. Representing the PAR's left-wing faction was a young upstart named Manuel Colom, who, despite only being 23 years of age, quickly gained traction and fame within the party on account of his fiery sermon-like speeches about how it was the duty of all God-fearing Catholics to fight against social injustice. Colom's revolutionary Catholic politics would later on be recognized as a precursor to the later liberation theology of the 1960s. Representing the center-left of the party would be Jorge Torrio Garrido. Torrio himself had a small political profile. 
best known for representing the businessmen of Guatemala in the provisional government that followed the 1944 revolution. Torriello had been handpicked by the PAR's leadership due to his distinct lack of political baggage, allowing him to serve as a unifying figure in the run-up to the election. On June 20th, 1955, at the PAR party convention, Torriello narrowly clinched the nomination from Colom, whose supporters protested outside of the convention and even held a symbolic nomination ceremony later on for the defeated Colom. In the general election, Torriello would face off against General Manuel Idigoras, the candidate of the main center-right opposition party, Partido de Reconciliación, or the Reconciliation Party. However, as election day, which was the 10th of November, neared, Idigoras suffered from an October surprise when his private medical records were leaked showing that the general had been suffering from late-onset schizophrenia since at least 1953. With Irigoras remaining defiant in the election now too close to choose another candidate, the Reconciliation Party suffered a devastating electoral loss in the 1956 election. With the PAR reinforcing its majority in the unicameral National Congress, and Torriello being elected the next president of Guatemala, further strengthening Guatemala's young democracy and ushering in a new era of improved relations with the rest of Central America, whose cadios had grown to despise Arbenz. The first few years of Torriello's presidency would be largely uneventful. However, 1958 would mark the beginning of a series of events that would fundamentally change the nation of Guatemala forever. On January 1, 1958, a decade earlier than in our timeline, the Hurun Marinala Hydroelectric Dam on the Michatoya River would be completed ensuring that vast stretches of Guatemala would now have access to electricity, which resulted in a construction boom as small villages grew into modern towns, and some of those towns into cities. The resulting economic boom was made possible due to a government-sponsored program that allotted generous subsidies for new construction in areas now supplied by the Hurun Marinala Dam. And where did these generous subsidies come from? Well, instead of raising taxes or taking on foreign loans, the subsidies were drawn from the total government profits earned from the Guatemalan Fruit Cooperative, which had now expanded its operations into the Caribbean under the Torriello administration. In a poll conducted in mid-1958, 93 of those surveyed stated that they felt like they were living in Guatemala's golden age. During this era, former President Arben spent his days managing both his fruit and coffee farm with his son, Juan Jacobo as well as spending months on end in Paris, France with his wife and daughter, Arabella, who found herself quickly becoming one of the most famous models in the Parisian fashion scene. As many Central American observers declared the birth of the Guatemalan Golden Age, Torriello, who had come to power as a compromised candidate, yearned to achieve something of his own, rather than simply continuing Arbenz's progress. At a government rally in Guatemala City on July 1, 1958, Torriello gave the following speech. To my fellow Guatemalans, this era of peace and prosperity which we now enjoy is something you alone achieved. All the good developments in our lives these past few years are nothing more than the physical manifestation of your victory. Your victory that was won in a battle for the future of Guatemala. Would she be free or would she be trampled under a fascist jackboot? The people of Guatemala stood up and proclaimed for all the world to hear that they would live as free men and women. And now, with our future brighter than ever, I am ready to announce tonight that I intend to undo our last injustice. The number one priority of this administration going forward will be the renegotiation of the Wike Isinena Treaty, which unjustly cut the people of Guatemala off from our brothers and sisters in the Northeast. It is my dream to peacefully incorporate the people of British Honduras into our magnificent nation and share with them the prosperity that we have achieved. Torriello's speech left many of the British public as well as many within British Honduras, taken aback. In the past, Guatemala's dictators had always threatened to seize British Honduras by force, leaving the British very wary of any attempt to unify it with Guatemala. Likewise, in the past, many residents of British Honduras had felt that negotiations regarding their fate never consulted the people who lived there, while only focusing on the British and the Guatemalans. Torriello, who had consulted Arbenz numerous times on the matter before proceeding, was keenly aware of this. Two months before delivering his speech regarding the possible annexation of British Honduras, Torriello had secretly met with the leader of the British Honduran Independence Movement and the British Honduran People's United Party, George Cadel Price, in Guatemala City. During closed-door discussions, Cadel Price, who had long been an admirer of Jacobo Arbenz, admitted that he had mostly come out of curiosity of what Torriello had to say to him, as well as to see Guatemala City with his own eyes. Torriello delivered an impassioned pitch to Cadel Price, going over classified economic data as well as laying out a vision for what British Honduras would look like if it became part of Guatemala. 
Torrieo described his dream of transforming the colony of British Honduras into the Belize Special Administrative Region of the Republic of Guatemala, or the Belize SAR for short. The Guatemalans would take over the military defense of the region as well as its internal security. All residents of British Honduras would immediately obtain Guatemalan citizenship, along with all of its benefits, upon the transfer of sovereignty. However, there would also be a special judicial body of local judges and legal scholars to reconcile any Guatemalan laws that contradicted British Honduras' current legal code to ensure no citizens felt their rights were being taken away by the unification. Lastly, English would be made the second official language of Guatemala, and Spanish would be made the second official language of the Belize SAR. George Cadel Price found himself surprisingly open to the idea. Although he had initially scoffed at the idea of a union between the two nations, after seeing the immense progress made in the years since the 1944 revolution, even he began to think that unification might be beneficial for British Honduras in the long run. In the malaise that had consumed British foreign policy following the Suez Crisis, international observers were inconclusive in their predictions as to how the government of the United Kingdom would react. Torrieo, who'd planned for a negative reaction, sought to get ahead of the British by petitioning American President Dwight Eisenhower during a visit to the White House on July 14, 1958. Eisenhower, while initially considering siding with Britain regardless of its position on the matter, was moved by Torrieo's pitch for aiding Guatemala, which in recent years had become America's biggest trading partner within Central America. Eisenhower, concurrently viewing support for Guatemala as a sort of unspoken and definitive apology for the 1954 coup attempt, eventually told Torrieo that if he intended on a non-violent and democratic path to reunification, the United States would support his cause. On July 16th, after days of radio silence from the British government regarding the fate of British Honduras, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan announced to the British public that in light of the civil and courteous Guatemalan approach to the matter, that the British government would be open to arranging a referendum for unification in British Honduras, declaring that the people of British Honduras should be the ones to decide their future. Privately, Macmillan found the matter exhausting, and in the aftermath of the Suez Crisis, fear-mongering took place within his cabinet about the possibility of another Suez, which could be detrimental to Britain's already weakened international prestige. After Eisenhower had mentioned his support for Guatemala in a phone call with Macmillan, he'd made up his mind and began the necessary preparations with Parliament and the Governor-General of British Honduras. On September 1st, 1958, the groundwork for the 1959 British Honduras Unification Referendum was laid, as two main camps formed. The No Camp was led by the hastily constructed National Party, which advocated for British Honduras to remain a colony until future independence as Belize. The Yes Camp was led by the People Unity Party and George Cadel Price. The Yes Campaign consisted mostly of simply disseminating the plan for the creation of the Belize SAR, while also touting Guatemala's progressive and prosperous society. After months of rigorous campaigning, on August 10, 1959, the unification referendum was held. With 65% of the vote, the Yes Campaign won, with the people of British Honduras voting to become the Belize SAR of the Republic of Guatemala. The old colonial legislative assembly remained intact as preparations for the transfer of sovereignty were soon underway. On September 1st, 1959, the British military began its slow withdrawal from British Honduras, and that same day, George Cadel Price was elected as the provisional governor of the soon-to-be-created Belize SAR. On January 1st, 1960, in the heart of Belize City, God Save the Queen was played for a final time as the Union Jack was lowered. Afterward, the Guatemalan flag was raised as the Himno Nacional de Guatemala was played. President Torrieo and Governor Cato Price shared an embrace at the ceremony, which was also attended by the UK's Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Selwyn Lloyd. The rest of the Torrieo presidency was spent developing the relationship between Guatemala and Belize, further deepening the ties between the two lands. With access to the Belize SAR's coastal regions, the GFC further strengthened its trade ties with the southern United States and the Caribbean. Furthermore, many lower-class Belizeans quickly found good, stable, and honest work with the GFC. In the fall of 1961, Hurricane Hattie struck the Belize SAR. The damage was horrific, but the recovery efforts catalyzed mutual understanding and accelerated integration between Belize and Guatemala as images of Guatemalan first responders saving stranded Belizeans in the aftermath of the hurricane would be featured in numerous newspapers nationwide. The government of Guatemala pledged millions of quetzals to rebuild the affected areas, and reconstruction efforts begin immediately after recovery efforts ceased. 
As the 1962 election approached, President Torrijeo declared that he would also follow the example of Arevalo and Arbenz and decline to seek re-election. The 1962 election would pit the resurgent reconciliation party, which ran on a platform of criticizing the PAR's perceived preference for developing Belize while neglecting Guatemala, against a larger and far more unified PAR, which had absorbed the Belizean People's United Party after unification and added many of its senior members to the party leadership roster. After an impressive term managing the integration of Belize and Guatemala, as well as brushing up on his Spanish, in February 1962, Belize SAR Governor George Cadle Price, now legally a native-born Guatemalan citizen, announced that he intended to seek the presidency of Guatemala as a candidate of the PAR. Cadle Price appealed to the spirit of national unity, as well as proposing what he called his North and East policy, encouraging Guatemala to strengthen its ties with its English-speaking neighbors and create new business and trade opportunities for the nation. Due to Cato Price's strong showing in early party polls, as well as his mastery of Spanish and natural charisma, he was able to glide to the PAR nomination, and join the endorsement of Arevalo, Arbenz, and Torrijeo. Furthermore, Kittle Price's extensive campaigning throughout not just the urban centers, but also the rural Maya regions, endeared him to many across the nation. The Reconciliation Party nominated Julio Cesar Mendez Montenegro as its candidate, a more moderate choice than the last election. Before he was nominated, Mendez Montenegro agreed to undergo a full psychiatric exam to avoid any unwanted October surprises this time around. On November 10, 1962, Guatemalans across reunified Guatemala went to the polls and had their voice heard. With 52% of the vote, George Cadle Price was elected to be the next president of Guatemala, as the Reconciliation Party, who had done little outreach in the Belize SAR, was once again thrashed in the election. Cadle Price would enter office to much fanfare on March 15, 1963. 1963 is also a year that would see Guatemala emerge as a major regional power in Central America. The catalyst for this development would occur on October 3rd, 1963, when Guatemala's neighbor, Honduras, experienced a military coup just 10 days before the 1963 Honduran presidential elections, along with the creation of a military dictatorship. The president of Honduras, Ramon Villeda Morales, who, just like Arevalo and Arbenz, took power democratically after a long era of military rule, was overthrown by the Honduran military after it became apparent his successor, Modesto Rodas, would win the coming election and continue democratization and social reforms. Shortly after the coup, campesino farm workers who supported the pro-democracy movement in Honduras came into conflict with the Honduran military after the coup, which quickly turned violent. Without authorization from any governing body, be it the OAS or UN, Guatemalan President Cato Price, after receiving news of the situation from deposed President Villa de Morales and acting with emergency congressional approval, authorized Operation Democratic Renewal, a blitzkrieg-style military invasion of Honduras to restore Villa de Morales to the presidency and save the nation's young democracy. International outcry was immediate, especially from the OAS, who condemned Operation Democratic Renewal as, quote, socialist imperialism. In just two months, the Guatemalan military, which had long since rooted out corruption and developed into a highly professional fighting force, annihilated the Honduran military junta, with the invasion ending in a standoff at the Honduran presidential palace on February 3, 1964, that resulted in the death of all remaining junta members, in a victory for both the Guatemalan army as well as the people of Honduras. Villa de Morales was restored to the presidency, the coup was reversed, and on March 25, 1964, Modesto Rodas was elected president of Honduras, ushering in a new era of Guatemalan-Honduran friendship. George Cato Price was quoted as saying, Regardless of the criticism we receive, there is no price too high for the defense of democracy. Cato Price later clarified that Guatemalan military activities in Central America would never be motivated by a desire to export democracy to nations like El Salvador and Nicaragua, but only to defend it. Despite its disapproval of the Guatemalan government's reckless ferocity in the attack, the Guatemalan victory quietly impressed the United States, with President Johnson later remarking in a 1970 interview, Op Democratic Renewal. That war, that operation right there, was when Guatemala stopped being a banana republic in the eyes of the United States government and became an actual state to be reckoned with. End quote. In the aftermath of Operation Democratic Renewal, President Cato Price's popularity soared amongst the Guatemalan population, as Guatemala now enjoyed enhanced international prestige following its victory in Honduras. On January 20, 1968, President Cato Price announced his intention to run for a second term as President of Guatemala. However, the 1968 election was defined not by Guatemala's current political issues, 
but rather by La Guerra Sucia, or Dirty War, which was occurring in neighboring Mexico under the PRI dictatorship. With the Dirty War as the backdrop to the election, Cato Price framed the election as a choice between democracy or dictatorship, a characterization which his opponent, now perennial candidate Julio Cesar Mendez Montenegro, very much disliked. At the same time, the PAR had ruled Guatemala for 23 years now, and with the Reconciliation Party having learned its lessons from the previous election and now campaigning in both Guatemala and in Guatemala's Belize SAR, election observers predicted that Mendez Montenegro's more moderate platform, combined with electoral fatigue amongst PAR voters, might be enough for him to win the election. By September, both Cato Price and Mendez Montenegro had been formally nominated, and the Cato Price campaign worried greatly regarding polls showing both men neck and neck in the race. Then, another October surprise occurred. On October 2nd, 1968, after a summer of student protests and anti-government agitation, 10,000 student protesters from UNAM held a protest rally against the upcoming 1968 Mexican Olympics at La Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Mexico City's Tlatelolco neighborhood. At 6.15 p.m., the Mexican military surrounded the protests and shortly afterwards moved in, firing on the crowd and killing hundreds of students. When news of the Tlatelolco massacre reached Guatemala the following day, the Guatemalan government immediately began planning a response. What followed was Operation Resplendent Quetzal, a Guatemalan-based operation to help surviving Mexican student dissidents escape arrest and torture by the Mexican government. Honduras' main intelligence agency, Group 317, would also assist in intelligence gathering and helping to smuggle the students to safety in Guatemala. Secret Guatemalan agents, masquerading as anything from campesino farm workers to businessmen, would enter Mexico and collect the students from safe houses, transporting them across the border in vehicles belonging to the Guatemalan Fruit Cooperative. Operation Resplendent Quetzal ended in success on November 1, 1968 with hundreds of student protesters safely in exile in Guatemala and the Mexican government oblivious to what had happened until it was too late. Following Operation Resplendent Quetzal, President Cato Price, riding the current wave of huge popularity, would go on to win the 1968 election and begin his second term on March 15, 1969. Going into the 1970s, Guatemala largely disappeared from the world's headlines, preferring to focus on its people and its national development. The Guatemalan agricultural industry only continued to grow, first under Cato Price and later under his successor, Julio Cesar Mendez Montenegro, who finally became president after winning the 1974 election. Mendez Montenegro would later be defeated by PAR candidate Manuel Colom in the 1980 election. The Colom years, of which there would be 12 due to his winning re-election in the 1986 election, would see Guatemala become increasingly integrated with the Western world and increasingly technologically advanced a far cry from the devastated and war-torn Guatemala of our timeline in the 1980s. Without a civil war, a genocide, or a dictatorship, Guatemala's future was very bright. The 1992 election saw Reconciliation Party candidate and Mendez Montenegro's former vice president, Benicio Cerezo, run against the PAR candidate, Manuel Colom, who sought an unprecedented third term. However, in a political upset, neither man would win the election. A new political party, Winac, contested the election this year, seeking to disrupt the two-party political system that had come to dominate Guatemalan politics. Winac, meaning humanity in the local Maya language, would nominate immensely popular social activist Rigoberta Menchú as its candidate. Menchú, who'd first made a name for herself in the Guatemalan Congress as the defender of indigenous rights, would win over the hearts and minds of the nation in a three-way debate against Colón and Cerezo. The result would be historic. On November 10, 1992, Rigoberta Menchú would be elected the first female president of Guatemala. On March 15, 1993, President Menchú would be officially inaugurated. 79-year-old former president Jacobo Arbenz, long since retired from public life, would make one last appearance at Menchú's inauguration, saying in a very brief statement, Today is a day of joy and victory for the Maya people of Guatemala. I look forward to the continuing success of this great nation. Reporters noticed that despite his happy demeanor, the former president looked very frail. Two days after his 80th birthday, on September 16, 1993, Jacobo Arbenz, savior of Guatemalan democracy, passed away peacefully in his sleep. His legacy would be the peace enjoyed by future generations of Guatemala. Under Rigoberta Menchú, Guatemala would further integrate itself into the world economy, opening up new trade relationships across the world in the aftermath of the Soviet Union's collapse. 
Re-elected in the 1998 election, President Menchu would go down in Guatemalan history as one of the nation's greatest leaders, receiving worldwide praise for her efforts to support the preservation of the indigenous Maya culture and language, both of which enjoyed a renaissance throughout the 1990s and 2000s within Guatemala, thanks to the lack of a genocide against them during a civil war that never happened. On June 18, 2024, Guatemala was the nation with the highest standard of living in Central America. After decades of progress, which in our timeline had been squandered by war and hatred, Guatemala was a nation full of hope. This hope didn't appear out of thin air, but was instead cultivated throughout the years by the labor of Guatemala's citizens, the integrity of Guatemala's institutions, and the honesty of its politicians. After centuries of exploitation and tyranny, Guatemala finally realized its destiny as one of the most peaceful and prosperous nations on earth. With Guatemala's government and society, at long last, a worthy reflection of the land's natural beauty.